So I will be talking about uh, the shock development problem, which uh, in particular, I'll be talking about joint work with Theo Drivas from Strange Book, Steve Scholar from Davis, and Bad Vicol from Quran. Um, I, uh, not only do I want to talk about the result, but I also want to actually frame the problem of the shock development problem. So we'll be considering the full uh, Euler equations. So we have the conservation of momentum, we have the conservation of mass, and we have the conservation of energy. And here, U is the velocity, rho is the density, P is the pressure, E is the energy, and then... What is the word isentropic? So when the entropy is constant. So I'll be talking about the isentropic cases. So I should just say the full, you know, full Euler equations. And in particular, you can replace this conservation of energy by the transport of specific uh, entropy, uh, where we you can relate the entropy in terms of the pressure uh, uh, in this way. And key to these equations is the sound speed, which says the speed at which determines the speed of a disturbance are propagated. What is gamma again? Gamma is the um, adiabatic exponent. It, it tells the, the it, it's, so we're assuming an ideal uh, pressure law and it, it pops up here. Uh, that, that's an assumption on the pressure law. Yes, that's an assumption on the pressure So we take gamma greater than one. Uh, greater than one. But the S is a constant of um, is It's where, like, why do you have derivatives of S? Sorry? You said S is a constant? No, in the case of isentropic Euler, which is not what we consider, S is a constant. Oh, but in the full Euler equations, S is not necessarily a constant. But it's conserved. But it's, con it's transported like this. So, uh, so, and this is, the, uh, sorry, yeah, this, is the, this is in terms of the specific entropy, where the entropy uh, is the density times the specific entropy, I should say. Okay, so I will be talking. Let me go back. So sure. I, I want to see what the sound speed is. So can, I, can I see the sound speed? Uh, can I compute that just by linearization? How do I compute that? I mean, it's just, you, you, I mean, you can, I mean, this is just a, a formula. What, do you mean you, you want to talk about how quickly disturbances move? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's in terms of you take, the, you take the velocity, so the velocity plus or minus the sound speed. So that's the, uh, that determines like how, so this is, so in particular, means like, like, so this is what it means by, so the, the disturbance will make, move with the flow, flow so uh -huh. u, then plus or minus the sound speed. And that determines, uh, that determines the acoustic cone and everything. But the sound speed is depending on the density. Yes. It's a function of the density. I mean, the pressure. I mean, it's a function the pressure. Yeah. 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 Yes. In the case of the isentropic case. I'm just wondering just whether I can see that immediately from the equation. No, I mean, oh, uh, so <laughs> you, you, will, you, okay. will, you will see this in the equations coming up. When I introduce Riemann invariance, you will see this. Okay. That's so right now it's just a definition. definition. Right now it's just a definition, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you why okay. this is actually <laughs> good for the sound speed. So I'll be interested in describing so shock waves. So this is a, some sort of jet. Um, and here you have these shock waves that form in here. So a shock wave forms when the speed of dis uh, disturbance exceeds the local speed of sound. Okay. Now, uh, a fundamental problem in compressible fluids is to provide a complete description of both the formation of a shock and its development. Now, now can you say what the shock is again? Is there a discontinuity or? Yes, so this is what this is. So I'm just gonna say. Yes. <laughs> so the, so the, the solution will be smooth up to a pre-shock where initial singularity occurs. Uh, and the pre-shock will be co-dimension two in space-time, co-dimension two space-time hypersurface. The shock will be co-dimension uh, space-time hypersurface with boundary given by the pre-shock. Uh, we have that the solution will be C1 on either side of the shock, and you have discontinuities across the shock, which will be uh, governed by the Rankine-Uganol uh, 
uh, jump conditions. And I'm going to make all this precise in the coming slides. One. So, so this is very easy to understand in one dimension. I think yes. I'm familiar with that. I just sure. wanted to write. Yes. So it is similar in that respect, like for, for burgers or for. I mean, shocks are inherently one dimensional, even though they look, even though you, you look at them in multi dimensions. The actual shock is inherently one dimensional if you think of it as a surface and in terms of the norm of the surface. I mean, in the case of, in the case of, I mean, yeah, it, it's one dimensional in the sense that in the direction normal to the shock surface. So this is sort of just a pictorial description of, of what we have. So we're going to start from some smooth initial data. A shock will, a singularity will form, which we're going to call the pre-shock. And from this singularity, we're going to develop the shock. And I just didn't say at the end, this is a mysterious thing called weak discontinuities, uh, which is a major theme of this talk. And I'll, I'll, and I'll talk about this. But after shock forms, you'll get weak discontinuities weak discontinuities, but I haven't said what they are. Okay, so this is in time, this is in space. In, so this is say uh, one spatial dimension. So a pre-shock will form and then you have a shock and then you have another two lines here, which will be the weak discontinuities. And, and I, this remains mysterious for now. And everything will be smooth up to that time, right? Up to that time, everything is smooth. Okay, so what are weak discontinuities? Well, you're not going to find that on the slide, but this is sort of a, sort of a definition given in Landau uh, Lifshitz, which just says that uh, along with the, the shock surface or the shock curve, uh, there will be other discontinuities, but they won't be as bad as the shock. You don't necessarily expect it to be discontinuities across the surface, but you maybe expect discontinuities and higher derivatives across these surfaces. But there's no definition of what these weak uh, discontinuities are. And part of this talk uh, is to actually define what they are for the first time. Okay, so this is just a picture of formation. Uh, you want to go to see that. Share my screen. Um, what? Can you set that up? Let me just open the file. Okay, so this is an example of uh, starting at the pre-shock. Um, if you continue it on, a, there's artificial viscosity here, so it remains a bit smoother than it should, but you, you get a shock forming here. It starts at a point and becomes a line. And there's two little bumps up here. They will be important. <laughs> You, you may think that this is an art of numerical artifact, but these little two little bumps are actually quite important. So, so I, I've forgotten already. So at the beginning, are you, you don't have any viscosity or do you? There's no viscosity. There's no viscosity. No viscosity. No viscosity. No viscosity. Yeah. If I had viscosity, then the, then, then no I singularity. See, what would I see? Would I would just see I would not see shocks or you'd see a viscous shock, which is which is not an actual shock. So it, it's just it's, the way I would for burgers, right? Yeah. Sorry, so uh, that picture, that, that surface is um, the pre-shock hypersurface. The, the pre-shock happens at the, the, the first time I played that movie. Yeah. And then after that is the development. Um, so that is like... So this is already developed. So this is where the function would be discontinuity. There will be discontinuity here. And there's two little bumps here, which I'm going to describe. Yeah, so, so where is the discontinuity there? Just so I, I, it, it, it starts right in the origin, yeah. and then it spreads it says, out. It, it, a line. Line. it, it becomes a line. Yeah. Of course, there's 
to do the numerics, there's artificial viscosity, and so it looks a bit smoother than it, than it actually should be. But, uh, but the discontinuity will be a line here. I mean, a dark, I mean, th that's a curved area though, right? It, it is it is not an actual discontinuity because of it. it's a new right, it's but, but 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 in if you were to remove viscosity, then there'll be actual discontinuity. So that surface is a discontinuity. Yes, but but that doesn't look very planar. Sorry, it doesn't look very planar. You would you would, the earlier pictures you said these were all. Sort of I think you, this is the plot of the value of the of some function. Right? This is the plot of the density. This is a plot of the value. Uh, of the density. Not, 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 not I mean, the thing is two dimensional. Yeah. Yeah. You're just seeing the density so, which is making the jump along that line. Okay. Yeah. So that is the three-dimensional graph, and there is the jump on that okay. on top yeah. of that line, essentially. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So first, we'll start with formation results. So. Uh, Chris um, was the first uh, to show. Uh, uh, oh, I'm missing this slide. Oh, no. Uh, so, Chris was the first to show uh, formation. So, this is not just a singularity occurs, but you can actually describe the type of singularity that occurs. And he considered the case of 3D isentropic irrotational uh, data. Uh, this was extended by Luke and Speck uh, in the case of non-trivial vorticity for 2D. And we, uh, we considered the case of uh, azimuthal, where we, where we assume azimuthal symmetry, so the solution only depends on the angular variable. And the difference between azimuthal symmetry uh, and radial symmetry is that you can have non-trivial vorticity. So it's a good model equation. And I'll talk a lot about this azimuthal case in the following uh, slides. Uh, moreover, we're the first to describe the self-similar profile that the singularity forms uh, at the pre-shock. Well, in this case, yeah, at the, at the pre-shock. And then in the, and then we extended the analysis developed here into the 3D isentropic case where we solved the full uh, 3D isentropic uh, problem. Uh, and we also gave ourselves some the profile. Uh, with 3D compared to 2D, you also have to contend with uh, vortex stretching. And then uh, using uh, this result, we are actually able to do the full 3D uh, Euler where you have three different wave families. So this is sort of the first kind of result in the setting where you have three different wave families. So, and we're also able to uh, show a description of the cell similar profile. And uh, there's a recent result by Luke and Speck uh, where they also allow non-generic shocks. And I won't go into that in this talk. So, so which, which of these things are sort of stable? Uh, the, they're all proving stability in some, well, in some sense. Okay, so this is, the, the so first that. result is stable with, in the class oh, yeah, of yeah. irrotational yeah. solutions. Yeah. Uh, this one uh, is just stable. Uh, this one is stable within the class of azimuthal uh, <laughs> solutions. Uh, this one is just stable, stable, stable. Okay, so let me just draw a picture, a picture of the azimuthal case. So this is the azimuthal. And the good thing about the azimuthal symmetry, as I said, is that it allows for non-trivial vorticity. And so because we have um, local speed of uh, propagation, we're able to cut off the annuli, and you see a shock is forming here. This is this result. And then in the case of the, um, this is a case of a, of a shock forming, which starts at a point, okay? And you don't have, it's not discontinuous when you have the initial shock. It's actually, you see one, so this is a, major point that I'll get to 
uh, later on the talk. Okay. okay. Now, if I want to develop the shock, I need the, to develop the shock in the physical matter manner. And so I need to, to find the uh, ranking Huguenot jump conditions. And so we start with this uh, uh, S dot being the speed of the shock. Uh, UN is the, uh, is the normal component of the velocity, normal to the uh, shock surface. And then we have the jump conditions. And so this is the, the jump across the shock. And so here's a picture, here's your shock, shock surface, and here's the solution on the right, here's the solution, uh, the, the variable on the left, and it's the, the difference uh, between the two. And it expresses the, so you have the expression of the shock speed in terms of, uh, in terms of these jumps, and you can solve uh, with this, you can, you can uh, solve the, uh, you, can, you can find sort of the weak solution that corresponds to the physical solution. One also must require uh, this entropy condition. Uh, so in particular, this enforces that entropy would jump across the shock. So even if you start uh, with the isentropic case, isentropic, so you, have, you start with constant entropy, immediately as the after shock forms, entropy will be created and you no longer you're in the non-isentropic case. So it's very important not to restrict yourself to the isentropic case. So can I, I want to ask about so so these are these conditions that you impose that are sort of coming from, from physics or they come directly from the equation? These come directly from the equation. So if you want to have a weak solution to the Euler equation, uh, you see that these conditions hold. Okay. So you do, it's basically from integration by parts. Right. And then you just need one extra condition to make it physical. So this is not, this doesn't enforce that it's a weak it's solution, not, but these, these three do. These three Perfect. just come from the equation, okay. that it's a weak solution to the oil. Okay, so. Is that under the assumption that the shocks are smooth enough? So that's, that's under the assumption that the shock is smooth enough. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're assuming that in this whole uh, talk, we're going to assume some sort of regularity on either side of the shock. Yeah. So we have C1, yeah. C run space time regularity on the complement of the shock. And, and this is an important point, <laughs> as we'll see. Um, so. So the weak discontinuities are not going to be discontinuities on the derivatives? No, they're going to be on higher derivatives. Okay, on higher derivatives. Okay. We'll see, yeah. So in the... Oh, but again, you, you, do you make the assumption that the discontinuities are along, uh, along a reasonably smooth curve or, or surface, or does that come out of the equations? Uh, I mean, that comes out of the equations. I mean, yes, you, you would assume, I mean, in, in, the, in the construction, you, you, you're proving a contraction within when you're assuming some regularity on the curves themselves. But yeah, you, you, you do get it from there. As long as you have some sort of regularity, you, you will get that. Right? Well, so, so, but anyway, the, 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 this machine will actually construct some solutions. Yes. I mean, uh, that's the point. Is that if you really would... say anything about all solutions? It doesn't say anything about any, I'll, I'll get into the point about like all weak solutions in two slides, uh, but yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so in the 1D case, you have uh, global weak solutions. And you know, this goes back to the classic work, Glim, De Perna, Bressan. Uh, one, one thing to keep in mind, however, that such methods don't lead to any description of the actual shock part. And the regularity that you obtain is not sufficient to actually detect or describe with discontinuities, because I said that the derivatives are more than, uh, more than uh, so in higher derivatives. So implicitly, I'm actually assuming, uh, implicitly, I have to, I, I will actually, a posteriori show that we actually have more regularity than C1 on either side. 
and this is this is what you actually need in order to describe the weak discontinuities. So, uh, so you expect in one dimension with you know with this gas dynamics, you expect these weak discontinuities to appear. Yes, even in the in the one D equation, the one but they weren't described. Yeah, I understand. Uh, is there isn't there a result of the thermos that there's genetic or some other people that there's like you know some genetic piecewise C1 regularity for the solutions constructed there? Yes, but C1 is not enough no. to describe the weak uh, it's higher weak, right? it's higher derivatives. But I thought once you had the I thought it was more like you could you could have got, you could have gotten more 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 regularity out of this argument, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I think you just get lip sheets on that. So, that's, that's, yeah. so will your results apply to 1D also? Or? Yes, you can apply to the simpler cases of 1D okay. case. So, um, so in fact, the result will be, um, it will be, it will be, the result will be in terms of the azimuthal case, which is, which is a, after symmetry became comes 1D, although it's more complicated than the original 1D yeah, for a problem because you have a lot of extra and you have vorticity and, and et cetera. Uh, so one important thing to keep in mind is that uh, once the shock forms, uh, the, the entropy condition forces a jump in entropy. So even if you start with isentropic boiler, you end up with non-isentropic after the formation of the shock. Also, uh, if you define this so specific uh, vorticity, which is just the vorticity divided by the, um, by the density, then it satisfies this equation. And this is the baroclinic torque on the right-hand side. And any misalignment of the sound speed uh, with, the, with the entropy uh, generates vorticity. So generically, uh, you can start from irritational solutions and end up with uh, non-trivial vorticity. So even though it's before the pre-shock, you know, uh, being irritational and being uh, isentropic gets propagated, as soon as the singularity forms, you have to go into the, the full uh, Euler equations. With one caveat being that uh, if you impose radial symmetry, then you can just uh, force uh, that there's no misalignment of the of the vorticity, and so you can avoid at least the production of vorticity. Yeah, could, could you define that vorticity again? I, I can't remember. Yeah. It's just here. It's just the vorticity is just the curl of oh, u. Just... This is in two D. Yeah, okay. So curl u, and then the specific vorticity is the one that we care about, where you divide by rho. No, that, no I, I want with the density. Sorry. Entropy. The entropy, the that, that's what I, I, I can't remember. So you can define entropy in terms of the pressure in, in this way. So you can solve for S. So this is something to keep in mind is that even though you can start with nice isentropic irritational um, solutions, if you want to solve the shock problem, you better be able, the shock development problem, you better be able to deal with vorticity and entropy. Uh, so uh, using the complex integration theory of Camillo and Laszlo, uh, uh, Kyrda Rowley, and uh, Dalalas and Kremlin show that you can get non-uniqueness of weak admissible solutions to the, uh, the compressible oil equations uh, starting from Riemann uh, initial data. And in fact, they, they start in the, um, the isentropic case and they can construct, uh, they can construct uh, uh, isent weak solutions which are uh, which are to the isentropic equation. So it, it doesn't fit within the framework that I just described. So it's just, it's just you have a, a discontinuity, like one, what, what, what yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, the straight yeah, discontinuity, yeah. one, zero, yeah, like one, one, oh, one, one half yeah, of the density. Yeah. 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 And they show that if you impose the um, entropy inequality, you still get non-uniqueness. 
Okay, and this has been extended by various authors. I'm not, I'm sorry if I don't uh, cite all the authors, I'm not familiar with the literature. Um, but the point here is that this is a this is a different sort of class of solutions that we're considering before, because in before we're considering that we have some regularity on either side of the shock, and the shock is only the, is only a is a uh, uh, a codimension one hypersurface. So in fact, the framework that I described here rules out such solutions where that where you end up with solutions which the the not uh, the, the irregularity happens in a region. Okay. So uh, Le Bo in 94 in a thesis, this is a fantastic thesis that sometimes is forgotten, but it was that she, she proved the existence uh, of uh, uh, the existence of, uh, for, sorry, shock development and uh, formation for two by two P systems. And this was extended by various author authors. Yin extended this to, in the first time to the Euler equations, uh, where they, he showed uh, the existence of weak solutions, um, uh, weak solutions pass uh, the pre-shock. However, no uniqueness is given and you have no description of actually the it's the same sort of framework before in this 1D setting where you don't have any description of the shock or the, or the weak discontinuities. Uh, Christodoulou and Lisbach uh, studied the, also the spherically symmetric case or the radial case of isentropic Euler. And they solved what they call the restricted problem uh, where you do have a uniqueness, but the problem is it's not actually a weak solution to the Euler equation. So you're not really solving the problem. Uh, in multi dimensions, uh, they, so this is just with Krista Dulu, sorry. Uh, he, they, he also considered this restricted um, development problem where one ignores vorticity, in particular, one ignores uh, vorticity creation and one ignores entropy creation, um, and you get some problem. But the weak solution that you get in the end is not a weak solution to all the equations. And so uh, in this result, Theo, Stephen, um, and Vlad, we developed the full Euler equations uh, under azimuthal symmetry, uh, satis satisfying the ranking uh, Huguenot uh, jump conditions. And we obtained uniqueness, and we have a full description of the shock and also the weak discontinuities for the first time. So, yeah. And so first I want to rewrite this equation in azimuthal symmetry so I can state the result. So this is just the uh, full Euler equations in azimuthal symmetry. So remember azimuthal is just, a, depends on the angle. Now we impose the symmetry. Okay, so this is in, in, in radial coordinates. But now we impose the symmetry and we get left with this equation here. Okay, so uh, A, uh, uh, B and C are in terms of the velocity U, uh, in terms of the, uh, well, hit, hit, sorry. Uh, so C is in terms of, is, uh, is an angular sound speed. <clears throat> B is the velocity in the, the uh, angular direction. And A is the, is the direction in the radial direction, is the velocity in the radial direction. And here's K is the entropy, specific entropy. Okay, now let's uh, restrict to the case gamma equals two. Everything I say here also holds for generic, for any uh, gamma greater than one, but just for simplicity, because it's, when it's 150 page paper, so it's a long thing, we're gonna restrict to the gamma equals two. So uh, this is answering your question from the beginning. Uh, so if we rewrite the equation in terms of Riemann invariance, so we take, this is the velocity in the angular direction plus the angular sound speed minus the angular sound speed, uh, then we end up with this equation here. And the point is that, so here's a transport equation, here's a transport equation uh, in terms of the, uh, the given sound speed. And so everything's been 
uh, rescaled. Everything's been uh, rescaled in time. So, so actually, this is this is really um, uh, the 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 lambda one and lambda two are really sorry. The lambda one and lambda three in the non rescale time are really the uh, b plus angular uh, sound speed minus the angular sound speed. So this in this way you see that this is the speed at which propagations um, propagate. So you end up with these equations here. Uh, so and uh, you can it's also useful to keep the equation for the angular um, sound speed. So I give it down here. So this the, the sound speed will be in terms of the, what we call the two characteristic. One Riemann invariant, which will be the slow Riemann invariant, will be in terms of the one characteristic. And the dominant Riemann, uh, Riemann invariant will be this number three. That's just how we choose the initial data. So lambda two is lambda one plus lambda three. Okay. Yes. Yes. Could you could you kind of repeat what they are? Because so so this is in terms of the actual velocity of the fluid, and this is the this is the like the the, the propagation of sound in one direction and propagation of sound. You're in the other choosing direction. initial condition, so lambda three is the dominant. And we choose that's it. Your choice. That's my choice. Yes. Uh, that's my choice. That 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 W will be the sorry, W will be the dominant in the band. Okay, so now I talked a lot about these weak uh, contact discontinuities. Uh, uh, weak, weak discontinuities, what are they? So here we start with, from a smooth initial data, you see everything smooth. And then the pre-shock forms, which is this red line here. And then after the pre-shock, we end up with uh, this discontinuity across the shock surface. And then we end up with a weak discontinuity here and a weak contact, uh, uh, so a weak ref, ref, uh, refraction wave here. And so the, the definition, uh, uh, what happens, the description of these, uh, these weak discontinuities is uh, that on one side we have C1 one half cusps and the velocity, density, and entropy, whereas the pressure and normal velocity remain C2. And this is why we call it a weak contact because there's better regularity in terms of the, the, the normal velocity. Uh, for the weak refraction, refraction waves, we have a C1 one half uh, cusp uh, on one side of, of the discontinu weak discontinuity on the shock side. And we also have that the normal velocity decreases in the direction of motion. So these are the, 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 these are the two types of uh, weak discontinuities. And you see that the regularity here is all much better than C1. And this is why we will need to infer better regularity than just Lipschitz. And this is why you can't sort of pick this up from the sort of historical works on, on, on continuations of similarities. So these weak discontinuities, you call them cusps, they occur on, on what kind of a co-dimension? So th this is in, uh, so in, in this case, it's, it's just, uh, so it's still co-dimension co one. Co-dimension one. Yeah. Your solution is in an annulus, right? In an annulus, yes. Okay. Yeah. That's why you were, you were having those pictures. We don't have. Exactly. Everything's in an annulus. But if you were to extend it uh, uh, without symmetry, uh, I mean, yeah, we, uh, we cut things off so that we don't have to deal with uh, mm -hmm. See, R equals zero. And we can, we're free to do that because of the, mm -hmm. the local because nature local. of the yeah. Okay, so, so so you've reduced this to a one D problem. Is that now with azimuth symmetry, it's reduced to a one D problem. Yes, that's right. I didn't quite follow how. It, uh, but the the point of really draw pictures now in one in just a Now I can point to one. Now I can draw pictures in one D. Right. right. And the, the reason we choose this azimuth of symmetry is so that we can keep all the structures of the actual and solution. Are those straight like lines. So this is in space time. So this is the yeah. spatial direction and this is the time direction. So here is the shock, okay? And here is the, um, for the weak contact discontinuity and the weak refraction wave uh, curve here. And so, so 
The point is that, um, so this will have this, the evolution of the shock will be governed by the uh, Rankine uh, Uganog conditions. These weak continuity, uh, discontinuities, as we'll see, are just described in terms of, they're just propagated by these, uh, by these, uh, these wave speeds, lambda one and lambda two. So in fact, what you can think of them, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, is that they just cap they capture a, a memory of the, uh, of the roughness of the pre-shock. So the pre-shock will be C1, uh, uh, one third, and then you proper, you, you, this will force, um, you know, force all the objects in the system. And if you follow uh, the characteristic, the lambda one and lambda two characteristics, this will uh, carry this roughness um, out along these, these curves. But I'll go into this in more detail. Are you drawing that as uh, those are straight lines just for? Yeah, so just it's easier to draw a straight line. They're not, they're not, they're not actual. <laughs> they're not actual yeah, straight lines, but we're only doing it for a short amount of time, so they're approximately straight. Okay, so let's assume for simplicity that we have the specific entropy and the and the first Riemann invariant to be zero initially. Uh, this just simplifies the formation process. It doesn't simplify anything about the development because these will not stay zero. Okay. So I can't remember what those guys are. So, so one of this this one is the uh, this is the specific vorticity written in Angular. Okay. And this is the there's there's two Riemann invariants. Yeah. There's a subdominant and dominant, mm -hmm. and oh. Z is going to be the subdominant. Okay. okay. And so we we set the W to be non-zero, so it's certainly dominant over the the zero one. So this is the initial data. We have a slope. We have, say, the, the most negative slope here. A is just some function. So A is the direction in the radial direction. So we have uh, at the formation of the first singularity, which is the pre-shock, we get a uh, C one-third cusp occurring. Uh, all this stays zero. Uh, if we plot the derivative of uh, A, which is the direction, the velocity in the radial direction, we also get a C1 third cusp, but you see this is one derivative better uh, than, so it sends the is it there. Is the third magical or is this just for the example? Uh, the, the, you can choose it the other way. I mean, there's nothing okay, special about that, no, Yeah, yeah, no, it's just, it's just a choice. You, I mean, you, you can choose it the other way. Yeah. Yeah. I can make it one. Okay, uh, no, that's no. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing magical about it. So after, so this is, uh, so now let's look at the picture after the development of a shock. So this is the same cut scale scheme as before. So we have a discontinuity uh, in the dominant uh, Riemann variable. We have a discontinuity in the, uh, in the subdominant Riemann variable. Um, so we have so the so so in the entropy that is right we have that because we have the production of entropy and also the sub uh, dominant Riemann variable and then the velocity in the radial direction stays continuous. Okay, and then this is the same plot, but it's a plot of the derivatives of all these quantities. Okay, and then here you see this this is corresponds to this. C1 one half cusp, and here's another C1 one half cusp, and so forth. And so all these things that we show in this picture is what we prove. Okay, so th that's the setup. So I have to define what I mean by a, a, a shock solution. So we'll consider weak solutions uh, to be regular shock solutions. If we have the density bound <laughs> with away from vacuum, we have that we have a shock front, which is an orientable dimension one hypersurface, um, such that the that the U rho and E is discontinuous across S, satisfying the Rankine um, 
Huguenot conditions. We have entropy must be reduced at the shock. And we have, we assume space time literature's continuous uh, continuity on the complement of the shock surface. And this is the statement of our result. So we start from uh, initial data where, for simplicity, we assume uh, vanishing entropy and vanishing subdominant Riemann, uh, Riemann invariance Z. Of course, this isn't actually required. And we, in our paper, we actually describe how you generalize it for the general case. Um, then there exists a smooth solution, which forms a first a C1 third pre-shock at some time T1. And it may be further developed in a, to a unique regular shock solution for a short time. So you have uniqueness, like there's this one solution, which corresponds to this regular shock solution. Uh, now, so furthermore, we can describe, uh, uh, we can give um, asymptotics for the, uh, for the jump in the different variables. And we have that the solutions exhibit weak contact discontinuity and weak refraction plates. And as I said, implicitly, this implies that we have better regularity than just the regularity assumed here. So um, a posteriori, we, we, we obtain better regularity. Sorry, but, so what, what do you mean by uh, from smooth? So is this a result from any smooth? No, I mean, we set it's any- Because it, it might form actually like two points. No, no, but you, points, yeah. yes, but this, this, so we prove it in the case when these vanishes, but if you generalize it, then it holds in an open neighborhood, for an open neighborhood under azimuthal symmetry, all this stuff holds. But so the only assumption on the smooth initial data is that the entropy and the subdominant Riemann invariant vanishes. Yes. And then you're telling me no matter how you uh, choose the rest, you're just going to have a single open point. set. So near epsilon, near how we, we choose it such. So I haven't said the full description. We choose it like this. And then if you take any open set of initial data like of this. Ah, OK. Near so here. OK, so it's an open set nearby some specific choice. Exactly. OK, yeah. now I got it. Yeah. But I, I also want to understand if you go back maybe further up, uh, you were saying it has a unique, but it's unique. You can uniquely took you after shock forms is a unique solution. I just sort of didn't understand. There, there's a unique uh, regular shock solution. So under asymmetrical symmetry, right? Yeah. So under as asymmetrical symmetry and under this condition that we have space time that should continuity across the complement of the surface. So you have to impose this. I mean. Maybe you can get away with that and bring some. Maybe you can do something. I, I don't know. But in, in certainly, if you don't impose azimuthal symmetry, you need to impose a condition like this. Okay. Um, and yeah. So so we show it in this case, but you can you can remove this conditions as well. So wait a second. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Just to bother you again, but. So you you when so in your prescriptions of uh, for the solution azimuthal symmetry is not prescribed, right? So you're telling me if you prescribe all of those conditions, then it is also azimuthal symmetry. No, it, it, this is within the class of azimuthal oh, okay. so so data. The class, within the class of yeah. azimuthal. Yeah. So, so so that you're assuming is preserved by the equation. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So th this is unique within. Yeah. So. If you want a regular, the shock solution is also unique, and you, you're implicitly assuming here that the solution is as it's as it's okay. Fine. It's just that it was not weakened. Yeah, but that shouldn't be a requirement if you for the full mounting dimensional problem to get unique. It's mainly this sort of property that that uh, is is important for the for the full mounting dimensional problem. Yeah, yeah, I understand, but I was just wondering. But, but in this case, it is, yeah. If you, if you assume that there is a smooth uh, hypersurface, but I, you don't assume that it is like, you know, with the correct symmetry, can you actually yeah. prove that it has the, the correct symmetry? Uh, I imagine so. Well, we, we didn't prove it, but okay. I imagine so. You didn't so. prove it, but that's what you image, yeah. Okay. So the strategy of the, the proof is that first we need a, so I, I talked, I made an emphasis before in the beginning of the talk about how we described 
gave a very precise description of the of the first singularity and the subsequent structure and so forth. This wasn't for play, you know, this is really needed for the development. So you need a very precise description of the pre-shock. Uh, and then from that, you can develop, you can have an approximate developed solution. So the first approximation, and then you build a contraction in a neighborhood of this approximate solution. Um, and then a uh, posteriori, you obtain higher regularity bounds from which you can obtain the description of the weak discontinuities. So at first we need a detailed description of the pre-shock. So generically, uh, so in the setting that I described before, uh, uh, generically the, the pre-shock has this form. And this is, uh, this is not just like, because I chose the initial data such that it would be exactly this form. So as long as you uh, have the, an open set of, of, uh, open set of initial data in, in, of the format that I described before, you end up with this. And this is just generically, this is mainly the, the fact that you generically you end up with a C one third shock, a pre-shock. Okay, so the pre-shock has this form. And, and this is what we want to show. Uh, so it's obviously, it's C one third regular. So here is the position of the singularity, this data star. And T one is the position of the, is the time that the singularity occurs. And these are, so this should be B, this should be C one, this should be C two, are all explicitly computable constants. And in order to show these formula, uh, it's key to write everything in terms of Lagrangian um, labels. So we define eta phi um, in terms of the uh, lambda three and lambda two characteristics. And uh, what one finds if you don't do the analysis is that a shock occurs uh, when the Jacobian vanishes and, and also the second derivative uh, at the same time vanishes. Okay. But this is really the condition when the singularity occurs and this is uh, this sort of, uh, this will select the, the correct time at which the singularity occurs if you keep flowing things past the first singularity. So what's the eta again? Uh, eta is the Lagrangian label according to the lambda three characteristic, which is the dominant Riemann invariant which is the wave speed of the dominant Riemann um, invariant. So what you want is that, uh, so if the Jacobian goes to zero, then this, yeah. this corresponds to, and then it actually crosses. So you, 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 if you just continued on, you know, then, then the, the, you know, the solution, uh, you, know, you no longer get a one-to-one -one map with the, the eta. So you, you, from analysis, you obtain this. And so then, and the key thing to keep in mind is that why I've showed, told you that everything, you have all these discontinuities and so forth. If you just restrict to the, everything in Lagrangian variables in terms of this eta characteristic, then everything remains smooth. So this eta characteristic is causing the, causing the non-smoothness to occur. So if you write them in the, this Lagrangian variable, actually everything is uh, at least C4, but it's actually smooth. Okay, so then this is a key, this is a key observation. Uh, so now we want to, we want to invert eta. So we want to solve for the inverse of eta. Uh, and so we plug this in because we have vanishing of, of the first and second um, derivatives we end up with this equation here. Inverting this, we end up with a fractional. So here, we're taking this capital uh, theta to be the difference between the position where the singularity occurs and capital X is, is, the, uh, is the spatial, sorry, the, uh, this is the Lagrangian variable, the difference in the Lagrangian <laughs> variable that causes the singularity. And here you end up with this, uh, by inverting this, you end up with this fractional power series where you can find form specific formulas for F1, F2, F3. Now to obtain uh, this formula here, 
one simply uses that uh, the W is smooth along eta, and then you write the derivatives. Uh, then you can write W, and you can just invert, write W in terms of the uh, in terms of the inverse of eta, and you end up with these these powers here, which is directly sorry, uh, which directly come from these powers here. Okay, now so you can do a similar analysis for the A variable, uh, but instead you use the theta two characteristic and you get things are smoother. Things are smoother because the Jacobian doesn't vanish. One may ask is that I, I, I said everything is smooth under the, uh, the eta coordinates, uh, then by inverting, you end up with this formula here. But the same is true for A. Everything's smooth under A, and the A is smooth under the eta coordinates. So why don't I get a similar uh, expression here? It's because the derivatives with respect uh, to the Lagrangian variable of eta vanish after uh, the, the, the first two derivatives vanish. And you can see that by, by composing and inverting uh, eta and, and phi. And what you end up with an expression with the Jacobian of eta in the, the numerator and the Jacobian of, the, of, um, of phi in the denominator, Jacobian of eta vanishes, Jacobian of phi doesn't vanish. And so you see that the, the, the derivative, the Lagrangian derivative of A at the singularity um, vanishes. In is, terms the of, is the equation for phi correct? Or? Uh, yeah, this is phi. Ah, OK. That and is phi. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Copy so paste. Yeah, solving the flow for, for, for the yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is not, uh, this is, yeah, this, this is correct. Okay. And the reason why there's no z's here is because I assumed initially that z's equal to zero. Yeah. In theory, could you calculate this to? Any order at all? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, a couple of minutes. And so uh, now, okay, so now we have a description of the pre shock. I need to uh, actually develop this shock. And the first thing is to come up with an approximation. How do I come up with an approximation? So I, I had this expression of W at the at the pre-shock, what I can do is I can uh, solve uh, W on the left and the right of the shock um, according to characteristics by pretending it's uh, W and W plus and W minus satisfy a Burgess equation, except here I'm not um, saying that the actual shock is described by the, uh, the the ranking Huguenot conditions requires from the burgers. Here I prescribe what the shock is, and then I just compute from left and the right um, via characteristics, and you end up with this approximation for the uh, jump across the shock. Okay, so this this will be the basis of uh, this will be the basis to determine the asymptotics of all the other jumps, and then from the ranking. Uh, given all the conditions, we get uh, expression, expressions, approximate expressions for the jump in Z and the jump in K, which is the entropy. Okay. Now, uh, so, so now let's again define our characteristics, eta, phi, and uh, this should be psi, this is I'm missing here in terms of the lambda three, lambda two, and lambda one characteristics. We at the uh, so we have from this from these sort of heuristics you end up with approximate um, Lagrangian labels eta phi psi and this is a picture of the complexity. Okay, so what you actually want to so this is a picture. So here we have uh, here's the shock, and so you have in this data on the left which is going to hit the shock, data on the right, which is also going to hit the shock. And then according to the other characteristics, they're going to be transverse to the shock. And then this will follow uh, the, uh, the 
the so uh, this one will follow the lambda two, and this will follow the lambda one characteristic. And you can see that it's very complicated because we'll, we'll see this later. Is that to, to to find information about the jump over here? We're going to have to cross these weak contact discontinuities here, and and this is really what makes life like insanely difficult. And so to to to, to compare to say the the restricted development problem, uh, these don't exist. These lines. And so you're really just doing these lines like this, going to the one characteristic. It's a much easier problem. Okay, so we have an approximate solution, but we need a real uh, uh, actual solution. And this is created by a contraction. And so this is difficult. You, you start, you have an approximate, you have approximate curves, S, S1, S2. Uh, and this leads to a new approximation of the variables W, Z, A, and K. And from that, you can uh, get a new approximation of the curve itself. So you, well, how you find the curve itself is you actually have to solve past in a small neighborhood of this curve. You solve actually past it, and you use the implicit function theorem arguments in order to, to determine where the the new approximate shot curve should lie. So you you first so you first determine these three curves, then determine what should be the solution, and then you recompute the curves according to what you got. And you're then trying you to get keep a going, point. and then you try to try to get a fixed point exactly. of this uh, of this procedure. Exactly. Yeah. So so you, you have to recompute the the the, uh, the weak. The weak curves or just the shots? The weak curves are actually easy because they just follow the, the characteristics. Uh, the hardest one is, is this. So the, they just follow the, these characteristics, oh. um, phi and psi. The, the difficult one is the, the shock one because you have to solve the ranking. So you don't have to recompute them. Yeah. I oh, and you still have to recompute it. You still have to recompute them, yes, because, 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 the, because the Ws and the, yeah. the, the characteristics change. And then you have to also deal with the fact that so it, what's really nice about the restricted development problem is just everything is smooth here, everything is smooth here, and you just follow and you hit the, the curve. And you don't have to deal with any like losses or derivatives or anything like that, and, and then you just define the curve. But when you have these weak discontinuities, you, you have limited regularity, you have to cross things and be very careful. And so I basically run out of time. But the last thing um, I'll talk about is just, so where does these weak discontinuities come from? And I described this uh, sort of briefly before. If you take, say, the simplest case is take the entropy, okay? Entropy follows these blue characteristics here. Now, if you start along this line here, and this is just following uh, data from the pre-shock, which is rough, and it's propagating it out. Now, uh, if you follow a curve starting here, then you're away from the pre-shock, um, and the, you're starting from something which is smooth or smoother. I mean, it's still more difficult because you still have to follow from this point, you have to follow back with the, in terms of the red curves and, and so forth, but things are, things are, the, the point is that generically the, the solution along this, these lines here are actually uh, smooth restricted to one side and smooth restricted to the other side. The only place that you, other than the fact that you have a discontinuity, the only, only place where you get uh, really uh, irregular stuff is at this pre shot itself here. So they're an artifact of, of, sort of the history of the singularity. Um, and you have to, to attain so these higher regularities, you have to use sort of uh, clever, um, clever uh, Lagrangian sort of characteristic techniques in order to bound everything. And I just missed, I just missed one thing here, is that in, in, in trying to uh, prove that this is a contraction, one encounters a loss of derivative problem where you end up with a, this is say the expression of the derivative of W, which has two derivatives of the entropy. 
um, which is seems like something that won't close. And to actually close it, you have to introduce these things, what we call uh, good unknowns, uh, where in terms of these good unknowns, uh, you don't get a loss of derivative. So, it, and you can only do this at the next derivative level. It's, it's a lot like the Riemann variables, which kind of, uh, which work at the, at the, at the zero derivative level. This is at one derivative level. And this, this, you see here that you have no loss of derivative. Yeah. So, so is this a special trick? I mean, usually. This is a special it's trick. Yeah. Is there any? So I think it traces some, there's some things in, by Alan Ack that are similar. So is there any physical intuition behind this trick or just like out of it? Um, you, and you, need, <laughs> you need to have no loss of derivative. And if you, you play with this stuff enough, then you, you know how to, to, to combine things together in such a way that you don't get a loss of derivative. It is kind of surprising. Yes. It, it is, I mean, this caused a lot of problems um, before, we, before we figured this out. This, this, this was... <laughs> yeah, so this is, a, is this very uh, one-dimensional? Like you know, if you bundle and you model symmetry, because all the rest that you were describing, like you follow the characteristics, and you might imagine you can do it even in higher dimension. Yes. So, but so in the higher dimensional case, everything kind of remains the same, except now you have uh, the main difficulty is that you do end up with a loss of derivative you can't remove, which is in the normal, which is in the tangential direction of the of the shock. So you have derivatives in that, and you have to close energy estimates. Now, the, the saving grace is everything remains smooth in those uh, tangential directions. And we actually see this even in the Azimuthal case because we have a tangential, um, we have a tangential velocity, which is the A. And you see that the, the A has, has one better derivative uh, than the, uh, and the uh, one bit uh, has a better one better derivative than the, than the velocity. So you think actually that this method would stay stable if you don't take the uh, yes symmetric yes symmetric case. Of course, it's, you know it's it's another it's a, another set of technical problems, but the, the essence of the uh -huh. of the development is here. Because it is a one D. The essence of the actual shock is a one D phenomenon, even in higher dimensions. But it's harder to show that because of this fact that you have this loss of derivative and you have to do these energy estimates, and that's why you know even the formation problems, you know, the the the, the three D case and the two D case, while they borrow a lot of the central ideas from that Azimuthal case, you know, it's still a lot of work to actually to show. show. And so I've gone over time, covered everything, so thank you. I actually have a question from Zoom. So great talk, thank you. And I was wondering if you've considered looking at the problem sort of from a different point of view because I'm aware that there are some like results and some work that's being done in the direction of machine learning. So they do use like shock analysis and aerodynamics and like real world results. And then they like implement it with algorithms and try to optimize things as well. I'm not like that much familiar with the work, but maybe that could also yield some insights into mathematically what could be more like efficient or like better. I mean, you can certainly numerical methods give you an insight into what is true. And so in, in that sense, it's useful. Yes. Okay. Uh, so can you tell, can you conclude from this iteration scheme that you can get some regularity in the shock front? Like you had assumed that the shock front is C1, but can you actually get that? By assuming the shock front. I mean, the, I mean, the shock front in this case is just. I mean, it's just. Uh, you know, it's a. If you take a time slide, it's just a point. But so it only depends on time, in terms of the position. But it's C two in time. Ah, okay, fine. And this you get from the iteration scheme. So, yes. yeah. so you, and then this is you know important closing. So, 
in the papers you listed is all the like in all these works is the central uh, dynamics always funky uh the central dynamics is 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 uh, of sharks is one day yes i mean if you think of the picture i mean just the picture from the beginning of course it's <laughs> it's hard to prove that <laughs> but it's essentially one day but the actual dynamics themselves you know, essentially 1D, imagining the direction normal to the actual shot. So the way they prove it is also like to extract the, the, the dynamic model for the central uh, 1D variable and then prove that uh, it's safe. That the other things behave better. So with all the simplify, if I were just looking at 1D gas dynamics and I wanted to show there was this big singularity. Where yeah, you could apply this it, framework. Simpler, right? It would be much simpler, yeah. You wouldn't have all these extra variables. Yeah, yeah. It would be, it would just suddenly be much simpler. But you wouldn't see the weak discontinuity, so it can one day. Uh, you, you, yeah, you would see one entropy is greater. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay, and that would be different from the shock curve. Right? Yes. Ah, okay, I see, I see, I see. That's actually a much simpler question, right? Because you have all the other. Yeah. You have these other things to participate. In exactly. I was a time as. A, uh, but for, for that case, for gas dynamics, would that be the first time it's been proved or what? Yes, this is the first time that this weak content, uh, uh, content uh, so discontinuity for it being proved full stop. So if you apply this method even for the, just the 1D case, yeah. which you can, yeah. then it's a new result. Just a historical question. How did Landau Lifshitz like, guess these weak discontinuities? Like, did they? Look at pictures. Okay. I mean, I think you can kind of see that there must be because there's different characteristics in the equation that there, there might there must be some memory of this. Yeah, the, the initial. And I think that's what they. I mean, I can't talk for them, but I, that's what I imagine that they, where they came up with this conjecture. But they, yeah, they didn't say what they were. They just said that there has to be something else there that that. That is sort of a memory of this of this uh, the initial singularity, and, and as I said, you can actually see them. You know, if you look really hard, um, if you look really hard, you can actually see these weak discontinuities. That be these, these little bumps. Up here. And I'm sure numerical people, when they see that, they think it's probably just some sort of noise or whatever. But the actual, the, it's a real physical phenomenon. Okay, if there are no more questions, thanks to Sun.